Sit down. The robust rose pinkness of today cannot have escaped your attention. I'm wearing a rose pink chasuble of shot silk, and it's very odd, and it's very old, and it creases, and it's by Sir Ninian Compa, who did so much of the late work in this church. And it's worn only a few times a year, so it will never wear out. Why rose pink today? We have two really serious seasons in the church, Advent and Lent, and we're in Advent. These are what are called penitential seasons, times for changing the way we live. And one of the disciplines to achieve this used to be fasting. Less food, less drink, less of everything. And this could be quite harsh in monasteries where there wasn't a lot to eat anyway. So in each of the two seasons, one Sunday was set aside when these rules could be relaxed. And the Advent Sunday today is called Gaudete Sunday, which means rejoice. As St. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians today, and as we heard in the introit, rejoice. Rejoice always. And we mark this rejoicing by being in the rose pink. Rose pink does not indicate frivolity. Heaven forfend. It indicates a rejoicing within a divine process or season of the utmost seriousness, nothing less than the arrival of God in our lives again. The trouble is, I don't know many people who fast in Advent. Look at you. <coughs> feasting on Mozart and looking forward to lunch. And that is a problem. Advent disappears in the Christmas rush. But by anticipating Christmas, we lose so much in this rich season of purple and pink. And the way to have a good Advent is to ignore Christmas until Christmas comes. And good luck with that in Oxford Street. <laughs> but the church's year begins in Advent, and so do our spiritual lives. We begin with the Advent experience. We learn to live in an Advent way. Advent is more than a season. It's a way of living. A way of living open to everybody. A way of hoping that the truth will become clear to us. Looking out for God. Believing his promise. And the message of Advent is as fresh and radical as it always has been. God is drawing closer to us and drawing us closer to himself and to our surprise. It's our weakness, not our strength, which make room for him. So we learn to watch and wait with patience, hope and confidence because we are Advent people. Well, with only a week to go, what can we salvage from Advent? Advent is a time for being single-minded. We're being given a push to awake, to use the imagery of Advent, 
to be alert. Faith will grow in you, not by itself, but by a decision. Your decision to act, even in darkness, the darkness before the dawn, which is Advent. So we can fast in the sense of cutting away everything that distracts us from our search for God in his many likenesses in this distracted world. You see, we face the same questions which Jesus had to answer for himself. Is there a God and can I trust him? Jesus answered yes and remained faithful. We dither, but the question isn't going to go away. And Advent is a time for intensifying our search for answers with all the resources of sacred texts, literature, art, music, all that we have. O sapientia, O wisdom, that's today's Advent antiphon. And that's a good Advent. In today's Gospel, John the Baptist tells the priests and Levites, Among you stands one whom you do not know. There is our restlessness. Where is the Messiah? The one who is to save us from ourselves. We do not know him. One of the spiritual guides of our time, Ruth Burroughs, died recently. You can read her books on prayer and the spiritual life. She was a Carmelite nun, and very down to earth, like so many religious. When she was asked what spiritual direction was, she answered, most of the time it's telling people to behave themselves. She had spells of black depression. She never had emotional, mystical experiences. She said her life was very ordinary. God was not always present to her. She had to wait in darkness, as many of us do. Yet God found Ruth Burroughs, or Sister Rachel, as she was. She wrote, God offers himself in total love to each one of us. Our part is to open our hearts to receive that gift. This is an Advent theme again, the theme of readiness and expectancy, which we hear in the Magnificat. Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. We magnify, we honour the Lord when we open our hearts to accept God's love. In many ways, of course, nothing changes. We're disappointingly much the same as Ruth Burroughs found she was. Sometimes we are governed by compulsion. Sometimes we have a taste of divine freedom. Life is not straightforward. But one thing can change. What can change is the way we see our life and the lives of others. This is no longer about us and how we are doing. It's about the one who calls, the one who promises to come among us, the one John prophesied in the wilderness, the one for whom we wait in darkness. Our carol service tonight 
will begin in that darkness. Yet we watch for the light. That is an Advent moment, waiting in darkness. And this morning the choir will celebrate this theme of waiting for the Lord. In the beautiful offertory anthem, this is the record of John, written over 400 years ago by Orlando Gibbons. And there we shall hear again the first part of today's gospel, ending with that echo of Isaiah, make straight the way of the Lord. Let us try to clear away the obstacles we keep putting in his path, so that God can draw us closer to himself. Let us hear God's astonishing choice and call accepting each of us and promising to transform our lives. We are Advent people, so let us make straight the way of the Lord. Amen.